So how many stories have we done on black violence in schools? And how many kind of targets are there in schools? Well, let's start in the classroom. We've got the teachers. We've got the other students. We've got the security guards. We've got the hall monitors. We've got staff. We've got lunchroom people. We've got the administration. We've got neighbors. And we've got cops who come who come to the school to break up this enormous level of violence. Ask any teacher in America, they will tell you during the Obama administration, and it's still leaking a little bit into the Trump administration, that they were under enormous pressure not to discipline or punish black students because the word out of Washington was, if there's any difference between black students and white students, in discipline or in academic performance, there could be only one and only one reason for that, and that is white racism. Even though it's, you know, that was clear. But even still, it's kind of a little bit difficult to keep hearing that, as I heard it just yesterday on NPR, that somehow black students are victims of white racism whenever they get caught committing a crime. So let's take a look at some very recent examples of black violence, black criminality, uh, black and white hostility in schools. And then let's, then let's have a little reminder, of course, about how anybody could possibly say, as I heard, that everybody knows that black students and white students commit the same amount of crime, but only black students are punished and white students get away with it. Let's take a look at that fairy tale and remind, I'm going to remind you exactly where it comes from. Developing tonight, a local school system is investigating allegations that a bus driver is targeting certain children. Good evening, everyone. I'm Jovita Moore. I'm Justin Farmer. One father gave us this picture that he says shows his children as they're forced to stand in the school bus aisle. Channel 2's Matt Johnson live in Rockdale County. And Matt, you found out the driver's under investigation for alleged misconduct. I was only supposed to speak with that one father tonight, but multiple parents came up to us with different complaints about this same bus driver. They say they've been making those complaints to officials here for weeks. Now, they say, of course, there's safety concerns with kids standing on a moving bus, but they also say the minority kids don't have to do it. There was plenty of room for those kids to sit down. Aaron Chase says this picture of his two boys forced to stand on their school bus makes him furious. He was told it's due to overcrowding, but he believes that's not the only reason. There's clear seats to the right of the students, and only the white students are being made to stand up. The African-American bus driver is now the focus of an investigation by Rockdale County Schools. We spoke to Chase's 11-year-old son with his dad's permission about what bus rides to and from Davis Middle School have been like for the past six weeks. we got to hold on to the seats pretty tight so we don't fall over. I looked up Georgia law that allows for 20% above the designed seating capacity on school buses. But some kids say attempts to sit in open seats are denied. He says, like, young man, get out of the seat. We're not going to go nowhere. I reached out to the school district and they told me, quote, we certainly do take all allegations seriously and we'll give it the necessary time to completely investigate and find the facts of the situation. The mother of a child seen here throwing punches on the same bus says her son was punished indefinitely for just defending himself. That the bus driver told him he has to sit in the very front seat, that no one can sit there with him, they can't even speak to him. While the investigation is underway, Aaron Chase worries about the message getting through to children. She has demonstrated that it's okay to do this to other kids. Disturbing video posted to Instagram shows teenagers violently attacking their bus driver. Tonight, two of those teenagers face serious charges. The superintendent says that two girls from McNair High School attacked the DeKalb County school bus driver from behind when she asked a student to take a seat. Fox Size Portia Bruner joins us live with a closer look at this video. Portia? Yeah, we should point out investigators saying these two students are from McNair High School, but that this did not happen at the school. In fact, it happened shortly after the bus driver had pulled off. The investigators saying this driver was attacked, attacked from behind, which is why two students now, 17 and 18 years old, are facing some very serious charges. 
This is one of several videos that have gone viral on social media following the attack of a DeKalb County school bus driver on Friday. A Fox 5 viewer shared this one with us. It was posted on Instagram. We blurred the face of the driver in the dark shirt and muted the profane language. But lots of people have watched how the driver pushed the female student in the gray hoodie away from her, then resisted as the teen, who is now on the floor, sprayed her with mace. DeKalb Superintendent Dr. Stephen Green says the driver had already been attacked from behind while she sat at the wheel of the bus and had just left McNair High School Friday afternoon. New information tonight after a deputy is injured during a school fight. Investigators are releasing the 911 call of the altercation that unfolded at a Harrison Township High School. Well, we've had all our staff out here, but we've got the kids and parents separated, but we still probably need the sheriff to come and take notes. This all happened at the end of the school day at Summit Academy Transition High School. Officials say a massive fight between students and family members started, resulting in the minor injury of a deputy at the scene. No word yet on the cause or if charges will be filed. I think this one's down in Memphis. One of the fellas decided to take a few putt shots, a few gunshots, and a bus full of students. Hmm. Okay, so... To, to me, to teachers, to anybody who looks at any kind of criminal justice numbers, any kind of numbers generated by the schools, even though the schools are desperately trying to put those numbers down, down, down by just refusing to punish black people or by downgrading whatever they're punishing them for. I mean, it's still weird to hear somebody on the, on the radio talk about it in a completely different way than that. See, the people in the schools who have their numbers will go, yeah, well, we got some bad numbers here. This is out of proportion. That's out of proportion. Everything's out of proportion. But it's a good reason for it because we don't have the resources because white racism doesn't, they don't fund black schools. Okay, so flash forward to yesterday. I'm sitting there I'm in my car driving around. I may have been smoking a cigar in my car. I can't remember. Driving around. And I listened to NPR, and um, there, there's a guy from a foundation, I forget the name of the foundation, but he's talking about Betsy DeVos, Department of Education, and how they're starting to push back, trim back a little on this whole idea of racial disparity when it comes to uh, discipline and academic performance in schools. Basically, the people at the Department of Education are going, well, you know, that's not whatever you guys thought you were doing is not really working. And, um, you know, when we go into these schools with our eyes open, when we go into black schools with our eyes open, we see an enormous amount of violence, chaos, mayhem, and, all, and, and everything but learning. Here's why. But, and, and, and during this report, the report was only like five or five, ten minutes long. But during that five or ten minutes, they must have said five times that white kids and black kids commit the same amount of violence, smoke the same use the same amount of drugs, do everything wrong in equal amounts, and everybody knows that. I could just literally picture the guy shrugging his shoulders, scratching his head, going, damn. Why doesn't everybody understand that black kids and white kids are exactly the same when it comes to crime? I mean, wouldn't it be pretty if that were true? I mean, if it were true, first of all, we know we'd have to throw out basically every social science in, in the world. We'd have to throw out sociology, psychology, all the stuff we learned about kids and all the stuff we learned about Head Start and all the stuff we learned about, you know, all this early stuff in childhood. Because apparently, you know, none of it has any difference. We know black children grow up significantly different than white children. And now you're coming in here and telling us that, oh yeah, that doesn't have any, that doesn't make any difference whatsoever. So six days out of the week, you're in here saying, oh, yeah, well, black children grow up under these circumstances with X, Y, and Z, and white children have better circumstances with A, B, and C. That's why we need a lot more free stuff. You guys have heard that before, I hope. Anyway, the place, they, they didn't talk about this on the show, but there's only one place where they, where there's only one place where you really hear that Black children and white children in school commit the same amount of crime, same amount of violence, same amount of mayhem. And the place you hear that 
is something I think you, some of you might recognize this. It's what I call the super super census. We talk about this and don't make the black kids angry. Out in um, I saw, you know, every ten years you do the census, they pick a statistically significant number of families. I think the last I heard was thirty five hundred, and they do what I call the super census. They go into your house, and you don't just answer. 10 minutes worth of questions about you know where you live you answer an hour to two hours worth of stuff about your entire life your lifestyles and everybody in your household answers these questions one of the questions they ask the kids they ask everybody this but then they all then they extrapolate this for the kids so they ask two questions one oh so do you smoke rope do you use drugs but the one they ask the kids is, and every, you know, and everybody else too, come to think of it, is, hey, have you committed a crime in the last year? So these are both called self-reporting. I mean, it's kind of like, and, 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 and it's been, this self-reporting has gone through lots and lots of testing where it's been, been, been disproved. Its effectiveness has been disproved lots and lots of times, especially on certain crimes. Like, especially on certain cases like drug use and crime. I mean, to me, self-reporting is like, especially for crime, because we already know what the crime numbers are. We, we could look them up. And, and as bad as they are, they're a lot worse. It'd be like going to, I don't know, who's the big home run hitter now? Whoever it is. It'd be like going to Babe Ruth and saying, hey, babe. How many home runs, or say Roger, Roger, Roger Maris, when he hit all this, he hit 61 homers that year. Hey, Roger, how many home runs did you hit that year? Well, I hit 236. Hey, thank you, Roger. Thanks for your cooperation. Well, that's, what, that's where they get that number, that white kids and black kids commit the same amount of crime. They ask. It's called self-reporting. Lots of, got a couple chapters on self-reporting and don't make the black kids angry, angry. You really ought to check it out. Easy to get at Amazon where we talk about how they, they know, I mean, they actually test people. They test them. They test their blood. They test their hair. That's the only way you can tell uh, when it comes to drugs. That's the only way you could tell about somebody's drug use. Test them. I think it was at Johns Hopkins. They were doing a blood pressure test. And while they did the blood pressure test, they had the blood pressure, and they had got a blood sample in their hand. They asked the people involved in the study, they said, oh, yeah, you mind, you know, we're doing the studies. You know, don't worry about nothing. It's not going to come back on you. But um, doing some research about drug use. You know, do you guys use any drugs in the last month or year or so? Any pot, any coke? There, there's been like six of these kind of studies. And they all confirm each other's results. That when you ask People lie their ass off. In one study, it's in the Journal of Addictive Behaviors. Again, the, the link's in the book. There you go. They say when you ask and self-reporting for drug use, people lie and they say the biggest indicator of a lie is whether the person answering the question is, quote, African-American. And that's the only way you can go on national public radio and pretend to the NPR audience that white kids and black kids are committing the same amount of crime. How about Asian kids? You want to throw them in there too? If studying and working hard and staying up till 11 o'clock at night, you know, when everybody else is out partying just because you want to get ready for that physics exam tomorrow, if that's a crime, oh yeah, lock them up. Get the numbers ready. But this delusion that lets this reporter and lets this news anchor have this conversation and this delusion that allows the audience to sit there and take it in without everybody writing an email going, are you insane? All the teachers, all the cops who know different, who know better. This is the biggest lie of our generation. And NPR spreads it around as if it's giving out jelly bellies. All because consuming 
that lie as if it's a piece of sweet candy. Sweet, sweet candy. is never going to make the black kids angry. <laughs>